What did the Earth's flora and fauna look like millions of years ago? Who were the first inhabitants to walk on the ground of our planet? Who hasn't asked this question? Since the beginning of our world, wonderful stories have been told about the birth of life. Since the appearance of the first men, humanity wanted to know, wanted to learn, hoped to understand. Thousands of years ago, these stories were more like myths and legends. Beliefs allowed us to fill the void left by the knowledge we lacked. Knowledge is a need for man since the dawn of time. Today, research, science, and technology allow us to understand our environment differently. But the quest for knowledge is still very much alive in each of us. The more we find answers, the more new questions seem to emerge. Nothing has changed between yesterday and today. The desire to know and understand is still as intense and deep. Why are we here? How did we arrive on Earth? Who were the first inhabitants of our planet? What was life on Earth like then? This existential question is inherent to humanity. It is characteristic of mankind. Dear Traveler, welcome. How would you like to go back in time to the moment when life first hatched, where it all begins? The appearance of life is an extraordinary and, perhaps, even unique phenomenon. No planet apart from our own seems to carry life. But are we really alone? The mystery remains unanswered to this day. One thing is sure, the case of the Earth is rare if not isolated. Going back in time to the beginnings of life, discovering the first beings, sometimes strange, who walked on the ground. Are you ready to take part in such a journey? The climatic conditions, the vegetation, and the animals have nothing to do with what you have known so far. The continents, the oceans, the landforms, the borders, everything is different. You won't have any landmarks. You will slip slowly into a world that is totally foreign to you. Surprise, admiration, joy, fear. You will undoubtedly go through a whole range of emotions as you discover. Our journey will take us to the ends of time, millions of years back. But before leaving for a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss anything. Thank you, and have a great odyssey. It all started billions of years ago. We will have to go back in time. The world that awaits us is so different, almost alien. I propose that you accompany me on a unique journey to follow in the footsteps of prehistoric plants and animals on Earth. As you probably know, everything started in the ocean. But how did life go from an aquatic universe to the possibility of a terrestrial world? Who inhabited the Earth before us? And our planet, what did it look like 50, 200, or 500 million years ago? Here is how it all began. About 3.5 billion years ago, the very first life form appeared on our planet. We will witness this unique and singular birth. Life hatched for the very first time on our planet. This is not a small thing, especially on a planet where the climatic conditions are still very hostile. The atmosphere contains little or no oxygen, but a number of gases are present, such as hydrogen, methane, ammonia and carbon dioxide. 
Water is also present on Earth. An ocean has formed, but the ozone layer is still absent from the Earth's landscape. You will have understood we are far from the world we know today. It is, however, in these conditions that the very first form of life will appear, a unicellular form of life, living beings made up of a single cell, like bacteria. Scientists believe that these bacteria probably emerge near hydrothermal springs under the ground. The temperature and the gases which escape undoubtedly supported its development. The appearance of bacteria is still a mystery to solve. Why did they appear? How did it happen? We will know perhaps one day. In the meantime, I suggest that you witness the birth of this first living being. The conditions are right for our bacteria to be born. How about giving it a name? It is the first terrestrial life, and it will trigger a great number of events. It deserves to be named, don't you think? How about Gaia? In Greek mythology, this is the name given to the goddess who created the world. Her name means Mother Earth. If Gaia has since become a metaphor for the Earth, it is also a term used to refer to a hypothesis put forward in the 1970s. According to the Gaia hypothesis, our planet and all the living beings in our world form a kind of superorganism. This complex superorganism, in which each element depends on the others, regulates itself and modifies itself according to its needs. In view of all that this little bacterium 50 times smaller than the diameter of a hair represents for the future of our planet, it is a name that seems to fit perfectly, right? So let's go and meet Gaia right now. Gaia, the little bacteria you see here, appears in the hollow of the ocean, a primary life in its simplest form. Microscopic, it is magnified nearly 1,000 times so that your eye can perceive it. It has no head, no eyes, no legs, no lungs, not even a brain. However, this creature formed from a single cell develops, grows, and multiplies. This is the nature of life. How does one manage to survive and reproduce without a digestive, respiratory or nervous system. As incredible as it may seem to you, nature is well made and some life forms are endowed with quite astonishing capacities. Nearly 3.5 billion years ago, life emerged on planet Earth and when this tiny life form appeared, the climatic, geological and atmospheric conditions were not the same as those you know today. Billions of years ago, the temperature on the surface of the Earth was high, the water in the oceans was very acidic, and the atmosphere, unlike today, was much more toxic, with a composition of mostly nitrogen, with CO2 and methane, and no trace of oxygen. However, Gaia, our little microscopic bacteria, that seems so fragile at first glance, was resistant enough to fight against these elements and survive in these extreme environments. If there's nothing else out there, you might be wondering what she could possibly feed on. The life of bacteria depends entirely on the presence of sugar. Sugar is indeed the essential nutrient for the survival of bacteria. Gaia finds sugar in the environment around her. Like any living being, it feeds, develops, and multiplies. Life seems to be peaceful, and nothing hinders its growth, for the moment at least. Life was then exclusively aquatic, 
and will remain so for nearly 3.4 billion years. Gaia and her billions of sisters were almost the only ones to populate the ocean, and generally speaking, our planet itself. It took a long, long, long time for terrestrial life to become possible. The first terrestrial plants, characterized by lichens and mosses, appeared only about 500 million years ago. And it was not until about 400 million years ago that we find traces of the first animals evolving on land. The first aquatic life was born nearly 4 billion years ago, while life on land was only possible 400 million years ago. The time lapse between these two life forms is considerable. The conditions were not yet met for the magic of Mother Nature to work. Evolution is complex, fragile, and requires time. But let's go back to Gaia and our story. As long as sugar was available in abundance, bacteria were flourishing in the ocean. But one day, this nutritive source, vital for microscopic bacteria like Gaia, ran out. The amount of sugar diminished a little more each day, and eventually ran out over time. To stay alive, however, sugar had to be found. If this resource were to disappear, the bacteria would sink with it. The only solution was for them to be able to make it themselves and this is where evolution and the power of adaptation of the living world come into play. Despite Gaia's cellular simplicity, she and her microscopic sisters managed to achieve this feat, making their own nutrients. But beware, if we can consider that they are indeed autonomous in the creation and management of their food, they do not manage to do it alone. It is on our star, the Sun, however located at millions of kilometers from there, that everything rests. Indeed, bacteria use the mechanism of photosynthesis to survive. This process requires the energy of the Sun. The role of our star is therefore essential to the survival of bacteria. Nothing would have been possible without its presence. Bacteria living in the shallow waters of the ocean are exposed to sunlight, but also to a gas present in the air, carbon dioxide. By absorbing this gas, and thanks to the energy of the sun, they manage to transform the carbon dioxide into sugar, which they feed on. This is called photosynthesis. That is, they can produce organic matter from inorganic matter. The energy provided by the sun is used to oxidize water and reduce carbon dioxide. This process makes it possible to synthesize a new substance, the carbohydrate so sought after by the bacteria. Now that they have something to eat, they can again prosper, multiply, and grow. After several hundred million years of populating almost the entire ocean, these unicellular beings will see the appearance of the multicellular organism in their natural habitat. It makes a masterly entry into the aquatic world. One of the main theories resulting from the appearance of multicellular organisms is the symbiosis between several unicellular beings, evolving and merging over millions of years to form a distinct organism. New marine species then appear, with a soft body and without a skeleton, such as algae, jellyfish, or sponges. If their bodies leave traces in the sediments, they do not fossilize. It is therefore difficult to have a clear and precise vision of what they could look like. Many scientists have succeeded in studying these traces to imagine what would be the closest to the silhouette of these animals in reality.
Life remains confined to water. The molecules that make up living matter are photosensitive. They could be destroyed if they were subjected to certain types of radiation, especially ultraviolet light. 600 million years ago, ozone was formed and accumulated naturally in the stratosphere. This molecule, composed of three oxygen atoms, O3, absorbs ultraviolet rays, thus protecting living organisms from their harmful effects. At that moment, a first concentration threshold is reached, forming the ozone layer, which has repercussions on marine diversity. Ozone is favorable to the development of life when it is located beyond 15 kilometers of altitude, but it is particularly oxidizing and dangerous if it is found in the air around us. When the first organism capable of photosynthesis appeared, they sent oxygen into the atmosphere. After several hundred million years, this enrichment allowed the formation of a concentration of ozone in the upper atmosphere. About 548 million years ago, we find traces of the very first reef builders, the Claudina. This is probably the first animal with a calcareous shell. They mastered what is called biomineralization, a process of mineral production to design its exoskeleton. At that time, the living world was endowed with rather extraordinary abilities to adapt to its environment and survive in sometimes difficult conditions. During the Cambrian, many changes occurred in the ocean. New species appeared, such as the Metaspergina walcotti, one of the most primitive fishes that have roamed our oceans. It would have appeared about 505 million years ago. It is also one of the very first vertebrates. We recognize the beginnings of the gill arches. They move a little like a trout, but it is far from resembling the fish as we can imagine it today. It has no real face, even if we perceive two big eyes and nostril bags. One of the flagship species of the Cambrian is the trilobite. It is one of the very first animals whose body parts can be differentiated with greater ease. It is besides from these observations that it holds its name. One distinguishes three lobes, rounded parts with the head, the thorax, and the terminal part. There are many species of trilobites. The smallest measure one millimeter, while the largest can reach 70 centimeters or 28 inches long. This effervescence of new life in the ocean creates a certain emotion. Everything seems possible. But if underwater, life and only hope seem to reign. On land, everything is different. The spectacle is desolate. There is only a dry, dusty, and rocky ground as far as the eye can see. Nothing on the horizon except this heavy solitude. How could life be born in this desert landscape? Scientists suspect the presence of cyanobacteria at the most. No form of existence seems possible on the continent in the current state of things. It must be said that the climatic and geological conditions on Earth are much harsher than in the ocean. The ozone layer is not sufficient to allow an effective protection against the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Any form of life would be instantly destroyed. There is no vegetation cover. The surface of the continents is also being eroded away. The continent seems to be in a constant struggle. The conditions on the surface are extreme, hostile, and dangerous. The ocean, on the other hand, is a small corner of paradise where life teems and develops over hundreds of millions of years. New species will appear in this playground of all possibilities. 
all more surprising and incredible than the others, they constitute the first ecosystem of our planet, the marine ecosystem. We find, for example, the Anomalocaris, the Canadaspis, or Yohia tenuis. But until now, no one has ever trodden on the ground with his foot, or rather his paw. Arthropods are the first to walk on the ground. One day, this animal, more daring than the others, took its head out of the water for the first time. It dared to venture onto the bank. Curiosity? Lack of food in the ocean? A refuge against predators? Or the need to expand its environment on land? So many reasons that push these living beings to colonize the land. What is certain is that the first creatures triggered the butterfly effect of terrestrial life. A question must also come to your mind. How? How could it survive in such a hostile environment? The terrestrial environment seems so unfriendly and unfavorable to all life just a few minutes ago on Earth. So what happened to change the conditions in the ground of our planet? This is indeed the key element that we are missing to better understand terrestrial life. It took one condition, only one, but this one is essential, necessary, and vital. The development of animal life on Earth depends entirely on plant cover. The appearance of plants on our planet is therefore the key. Vegetation is indeed the first link in the food chain. Without it, the whole chain collapses or simply can't hatch. Let's go back a bit to understand how this happened. You'd probably like to meet the first animal to have lived on Earth. But be patient. Nothing has happened yet. We are at the end of the Cambrian, and we enter the Ordovician. We are about 485 million years old on the time scale. As you can see, the ocean is teeming with life. The first reefs are formed. Multicellular life is gradually established. Incredible species invade the waters. But on land, everything is different. The ground is covered with rocks as far as the eye can see. Look, everything seems deserted. There is a chilling silence. Nothing seems able to survive in such an extreme and hostile environment. Little by little, however, things change. Our journey takes us to the Ordovician period. It is there that we will land and put down our suitcases the time to observe what occurs in the surroundings. We are located between 485 and 443 million years ago. Here, the climate favoring their development, some plants manage to hang on and survive, despite the difficult conditions, both climatically and geologically. This tiny green thing that you see covering the ground is a Marcantia polymorpha. It belongs to the hepatic plants, i.e. without vascular system. Other types of liverworts, such as mosses, sphangum mosses, and anthocerotes will manage to make a small place for themselves on the continent. By themselves, they will form the first vegetation cover. No matter how small and minute, this little green box of moss and lichen is synonymous with life. The expansion of these plants has triggered a whole host of processes that have been decisive for the rest of our history. In particular, they have allowed the atmosphere to be depleted of CO2. But for the moment, nothing is yet certain. Too few elements favor the birth of life on Earth. Such a change takes time. Let's continue our progression 
on the geological time scale, and let's meet at the Silurian. We are now between 443 and 419 million years ago. At the approach of the Silurian about 443 million years ago, vegetation continues to develop. Green algae, of course, but also lichen on the surface and Cooksonia. This primitive plant is one of the first to have a vascular system, that is to say, that it is made of vessels allowing the circulation of water and sap. It is an enormous change for the vegetation. This evolution will favor a diversification of plants and an enrichment of the soil. But patience, let's not go too fast. Let's get back to our Cooksonia. We can recognize it by the little balls at the ends of the stems these little balls are sporangia. They are organs that emit spores. In botany, spores refer to the seed cells that can give birth to a new individual. This is why the Cooksonia is lining this patch of ground right in front of you. But another evolution is about to take place. A second threshold of oxygen and ozone is reached leading to the first terrestrial arthropods leaving the waters and settling little by little on the continents. This is possible because the plants that preceded them offer them the food necessary for their development. Once out of the water, animals must move to find food and develop a mobility strategy. They have an internal vascular system and hydrate themselves by eating or drinking water the reproduction remains dependent on the aquatic environment. This new vegetation will become the privileged habitat of a new kind of species, the insects. Here is our second link in the chain, one of the very first land animals to breathe the air of our planet and to walk on the ground as a millipede. The one you see here, near the Cooksonia, is a pneumodesmus, this herbivore is not the only one to benefit from the presence of plants in the area. In fact, it should beware of the one that is coming now. It is a scorpion. In the ocean, the scorpion, Eurypterus, is one of the emblematic species of the Silurian. It has no venom and preys on small prey, but it had much more impressive measurements than those we know today. It could reach nearly one meter or three feet. The one that moves under our eyes on dry land this time is far from reaching such proportions since it measures between six and nine centimeters or three inches approximately. This Paleophonus has taken up residence on the banks of rivers and lagoons, but our scorpion is not a terrestrial animal strictly speaking. By approaching a little closer, we can perceive its gills. This small animal is equipped for aquatic life. However, from time to time it ventures onto the banks if a potential meal is waiting for it. If the small number of these creatures and the rarity of these plants seem to make them insignificant compared to the immensity of the earth and the space they could occupy, they nevertheless allow to modify the face of the world. They are the trigger of a new era. The Devonian is situated between minus 419 and minus 358 million years. This is the time of the first forests. Yes, you heard me right, the first forests. But how can you go from lichen to a whole wood? The vegetation cover was formed little by little, of course. The Devonian represents millions of years. Every day that passes is a new promise for terrestrial life. But the most significant changes took place here and now. This is where it all began. During this period, 
especially in the Upper Devonian, our planet experienced an explosion of plant and animal life. If the Cambrian left an indelible mark on the ocean, the Devonian is without a doubt the one that will favor the enrichment and the development of the terrestrial soil. After our little escapade in the Silurian, let's go a handful of millions of years later, to the very beginning of the Devonian, to better understand these changes, these evolutions, and finally, the birth of life on Earth. Here, the temperature at the ground oscillates around 28 degrees Celsius, or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The oxygen level is close to 15%. The air is humid, and a light wind can be felt. Can you feel that little breeze on your skin? It is here in these conditions that the first forests will be born. You have to imagine that the surface of the Earth has changed somewhat since its creation. Mountain ranges have emerged, like the Appalachian Mountains, and rivers have made their beds. The panorama is extraordinary, but life is still in its infancy. For the moment, as you can see, we are still on a small vegetation cover. We are far from the spectacle offered by our current forests. Today, forests are made up of several layers, with the presence of hummus, litter, small plants, shrubs and bushes, and finally, large trees whose tops reach several meters high. Here, the highest point is about 50 centimeters or 20 inches. During the first half of the Devonian period, the flora was limited to the herbaceous stratum, with low plants generally located near waterways, such as Rhinia or Asteroxylon. The Asteroxylon is the larger of the two. It is covered with small scale-like leaves without veins. This plant species likes dry soils rich in organic matter. It is one of the first plants to form litter and thus enrich the soil with organic matter. The majority of the other species measure about 10 centimeters or 4 inches maximum. Then, a more varied vegetation allowed to enrich the soils, which in turn allowed the growth of new plants. It is a virtuous cycle that is established. 30 million years. 30 million years were necessary for the vegetation to evolve more clearly. The most striking phenomenon of this period is the appearance of the shrub and tree layer. We are going to make a new jump in time to realize these transformations. Here we are now, 30 million years later, at the dawn of a primitive forest. It now has some similarities to our current forests. Can you determine which ones? Indeed. This one functions through an ecosystem with floors with strata. There is the herbaceous stratum that we already know at ground level, but also the shrub layer, and finally, the highest, the tree layer. You see, tall trees such as those that are rising before our eyes 30 million years ago, they did not exist. There are four major groups of arborescent plants in the Devonian, the lycophytes, about 3 meters or 10 feet, the clad oxalales, about 8 meters or 26 feet, the anorophytales, about 1 meter or 3 feet, and finally, the archaeopteridales, up to 25 meters or 82 feet. Let's start by exploring the first layer of vegetation, the one in front of us, just under our feet. If it is less high, it is not easier to cross. Roots and stems intermingle and become a real vegetal mishmash. At the edge of the water, we can see Rhinia. 
They are part of the first terrestrial plants. At the end of their branching stems, there are small yellowish olives. These are not the fruits of the plants, but sporangia. Be careful when crossing the crossroads of low plants. You can easily get stuck. Their stems and bark are like Velcro. Sporangia plants like Cooksonia are very similar to the Rhinia you had the opportunity to observe a little earlier. They appeared a little earlier during the Silurian and continue to evolve. All the conditions are met for them to prosper. Under them, lycopodes, Lechlerchia, moss plants in a way, cover the ground. Let's leave this first stratum and go to the second level of the forest with the shrubs. Next to you, these are Relimia bushes. It is one of the first extraordinary phenomena of this so particular era. No bush, no shrub had until then plunged its roots in the bowels of the earth. A little further, while advancing until the edge of the forest, you can see Tetraxilopterus. All along the trunk are branches with stems of all sizes intertwined. It does not really have leaves as we can imagine from the knowledge we have of our current forests, but rather branched and flattened stems. If from afar the vegetation can resemble ours up close, there is no mistaking it. Many points differentiate them. They are far from being as high as in our forests on the one hand, and they rarely have leaves with many veins, as we are used to see. Some trees look like primitive weeping willows, others like the beginning of a cactus, thin and long. We realize how much these 30 million years have allowed to diversify and enrich the terrestrial vegetation. Nothing will ever be the same again. The richness of the soil favors a luxuriant and varied vegetation. All this constitutes a new ecosystem, a terrestrial ecosystem this time. We can see here one of the giants of this time, the Eospermatopterus. It measures approximately eight meters in height. Remember, that a few thousand years ago, the vegetation did not exceed 50 centimeters. Eight meters high, the change is radical. This is a specimen that occupies the tree stratum. Can you recognize the Eospermatopterus from here? It is the one that you can see with a gray-brown trunk in the distance. It looks like a palm tree. The trunk is long, straight, and thin. At the top, several branches form a ball. When one of them withers, it gives way, then forms the trunk. If you go a little deeper into the forest, you will meet the biggest of them all. It is an Archaeopteris. It is almost 25 meters or 82 feet high. It could be similar to our current fir trees for its shape since the branches start only on the upper part, leaving the rest of the trunk bare, and that the leafy part forms a triangle. One of the great characteristics of this tree, besides its size, is its leaves. They resemble our ferns in their configuration, and they can measure up to one meter or three feet. It also has a well-developed root system, that may have contributed to the formation of deep soil. Underneath this behemoth, you can see a small plant. Is it a nice fern specimen? Well, no, not yet. It is a very young Archaeopteris. The fern is a plant that is also found in the 21st century and yet already existed millions of years ago. You will be able to see it soon. A little patience, if the fern appears in the Devonian, like Osmondaceae or Hemonophyllaceae, it develops more widely in the Carboniferous. 
If plants could pass on their knowledge from generation to generation, they would have incredible stories to tell and immeasurable knowledge to offer us. But we don't have time for poetry. We must continue our study of the primeval forest. A little further on, you can see horsetails. These plants belong to the genus Sphenophyte. Another genus develops widely, that of Lycophytes, which includes Lycopods and Selaginellas. The Devonian is a very enriching period in terms of vegetation. The latter diversifies and becomes more and more abundant. It also brings new elements that will be integrated into a new ecosystem. Leaves, roots, arborescence, wood and bast appear. All these new elements can become a habitat or a new nutritive source for the species to come. If the plant biomass is still quite minimal and fragile, this plant cover, already well supplied and increasingly thick, allows some insects to see the day and to establish themselves on the ground. To see them, you will have to be patient and sharpen your sense of observation. Some of them are rather shy and shy nature, while others blend perfectly into the scenery. One of the oldest known springtails is this one. Rhinella precursor. It is only one to two millimeters long. It is therefore very difficult to observe with a naked eye. Despite its small size, it has its place in this new nature and plays an essential role. It belongs to the scavengers. It feeds on decomposing matter and thus allows to clean nature. The cycle of life settles down slowly in this incredible landscape, which the earth dresses. Here is another insect that lived for a long time in the Devonian period. But about it, great interrogations still reign in the spirits of the scientists. I propose here the two plausible versions of the famous Rhinognatha. For a long time, we considered it to be part of the group of flying insects. Its mouth parts were indeed reminiscent of those of a mayfly, a winged aquatic insect. Here is what our Rhinognatha would look like if these first investigations were correct. Some details suggest an animal of the order of myriapods, thus millipedes, and in particular, the Scudagiramorth millipede. It would then look more like this. Going back so far in time is not an easy thing. We have much more knowledge today than we did a few hundred years ago, and technology provides many answers. Nevertheless, such distant periods still conceal many mysteries, including the morphology of our millipede. On the other hand, we know a little more about the next insect, the Leverholmia. It measured no more than 10 centimeters or 32 inches and was recognizable thanks to its five pairs of walking legs. If you get a little closer, you will see that they are covered with hairs or bristles. The diet of this insect is quite varied. It feeds on spores, fragments of macerated plants or mushrooms. It is therefore a detritovirus insect. The plant litter is the environment that it favors to find what it needs to survive. It is notably thanks to this type of insect that the formation and enrichment of hummus is possible. If the vegetation and the development of insects constitutes a new ecosystem on our planet, the Devonian embodies many other novelties, in particular, the birth of an animal of a new kind, the ichthyostega, is very particular. It is a tetrapod with fish characters. It seems to be the missing link that allows us to understand 
one of the fundamental elements of the evolution and the arrival of certain animals on the Earth. If it is undoubtedly not alone in the key element that would fully solve the mystery, it constitutes a pivotal group, that of the vertebrates that tried to move from an aquatic to a terrestrial environment. The ichthyostega is a species of the stegocephalic group. It has a singular mobility since it is recognized for its primitive members as you can realize by observing this specimen, which comprises three beginnings of articulations which could be similar to the hip, the knee, and the ankle. What is rather surprising it is that it also preserves characteristics of fish. We note the presence of caudal fin, but also scales on the tail and the ventral face. As an adult, it develops internal gills. It seems to live mainly as a fish, but it can also spend some time on land. Others, like this one, appear to be the perfect cross between a fish and a reptile, or crocodilian land animal. Look at this tiktalic. It's a fish that looks like an alligator, don't you think? If the trunk and the tail seem to suggest a fish, the line of the head is largely similar to that of the alligator. The fins are clearly visible on the flanks, but they are a sort of cross between real fins and legs. Its articulated bony skeleton and its famous legs allow it to move over short distances in the lagoons. The elpistosteg bears some similarities with the tiktalic. The scales, the short head, the elongated and thin trunk, the caudal part as well as the anal fin are also present in it. The pandericthus, as for him, if he seems to have some common characteristics with the tetrapods, looks much more like a prehistoric fish. It is part of those groups with a form anatomically transitional of the tetrapods. This one measures about 90 centimeters or 35 inches, but the biggest ones can reach 130 centimeters or 50 inches. Under its catfish appearance, it preserves an internal skeleton with pectoral and pelvic fins. It also has chiridian limbs. That is to say, that it is made up of articulated locomotive appendages which enable it to swim, but also to walk. It is on this improbable meeting that we will close the chapter of the Devonian. An ice cap appeared at the end of this period at the South Pole. Other changes are coming. It's time to continue our journey and get back on the road to land in the Carboniferous. Did you feel the air getting cooler before we left? The global temperature has dropped a lot due to decreases in CO2 levels in the atmosphere by plants. It is now an average of 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit, a much lower temperature than what we experienced just before. The vegetation cover has expanded. Oxygen levels have increased from 15 to 25 percent. The atmosphere is changing. The climate is changing. Other changes have also occurred on the surface of the Earth. Seen from the sky, it no longer looks like a desert rock. We can clearly see the new vegetation that is growing. One of the striking elements of this period is the mutation of this vegetation cover. Until now, we found more or less the same specimens a little everywhere. But little by little, from minus 358 million years ago, at the beginning of the Carboniferous period, the variation in temperature between the poles and the equator favored the growth of very distinct forests, depending on the continents and regions this is called climatic zonation. This leads to demarcations in the vegetation and consequently in the animal population that lives there. 
the coal-bearing forests develop at the equator. This is the beginning of the rainforest, so to speak. Would you like to find out more about this particular area? Then let's go. Here we are, the rainforest, in the middle of the Carboniferous period, about 320 million years ago. Forests developed in the swampy areas of the region. From this vegetation, coal, also known as coal, was produced over time, hence the name coal forest. Look at how much denser and more abundant the vegetation seems than it was a few million years ago. Here we find the Lepidodendron. It is a swamp tree. The trunk is rather broad, high, and the bark is very thick. It could probably reach almost 30 meters or 98 feet high and two meters or seven feet in diameter. At the top, there is what appears to be close to pine thorn foliage. Under the ground, they are not yet roots as such that allow the tree to feed itself and produce the energy necessary for its development, but rather stems. Some specimens like the one we are lucky enough to have in front of us at this moment, had cones in their branches, a bit like the pine cone, carrying the spores, allowing species similar to Lipidodendron to reproduce. These cones will give their name to conifers. The first of the genus were moored to the earth during the Carboniferous, and some of them managed to reach the secondary era, the Mesozoic. Then, important climatic changes took their toll on many of them, but they held on and are still there today populating our forests. A little further on your right, here is another tree that appreciates this type of swampy soil. The Sigillaria could also reach 30 meters or 98 feet in height, but its trunk, even though it is tall, is more fragile Depending on the specimen, the trunk is single or forked. It was not formed of wood per se, but rather a layer of tightly packed leaf bases that as the plant grows becomes a trunk. Underneath what looks like a trunk, there is a base of leaves, and then in the center, the pith of the tree, which is rather fibrous. The leaves are long and thin. They look like grass gathered around a stem. This calamite is a little bit higher. Indeed, this tree horsetail could reach between 30 and 50 meters in height. That is to say, between 100 and 165 feet high. As you can see, the trunk appears segmented, a bit like bamboos. Again, there are needle-like leaves and cones of some sort. The leaves, branches, and cones seem to grow from the same node which is what we call a whorl in botany. There is also the chordata, which you should definitely take a closer look at. There are several specimens a little further on. Let's get closer. You see, the trunk of this tree ends in a bunch of leaves. So far, nothing radically different from the first trees we saw. But look a little closer at the leaves. Touch them. Do you notice anything? It looks like leather. Long ribbons of leather from 25 centimeters to one meter long and nearly 15 centimeters wide. That's 10 inches to three feet long and nearly six feet wide. These leaves are attached directly to the stem. There is another plant I told you about earlier that I would like to introduce you to now. It's just around the corner. This is the fern. There are many kinds of ferns in this swampy area, including the seed fern, which carries the seeds with its foliage. Here is another one that is a bit special. We call it a giant fern. If at the level of the leaves, the resemblance is rather striking with the ferns which we can see in various areas of the world, the plant is higher and often characterized by a small shrub. 
It is indeed part of the aborescent ferns. It is a Saronius. Here is another species of fern, the Sphenopterus. The frond of this one can reach 50 centimeters, or about 20 inches. It seems fragile like that, but it will nevertheless last from the Upper Devonian to the Cretaceous. As what? One should not trust the appearances. This pretty fern will be used as a transition to discover the second forest which awaits us. We will find there ferns, of course, but also other trees characteristic of this zone far from the equator. We are going to make a jump of several hundred kilometers. Are you ready? Here, in what can be described as the temperate zone, we will find another type of tree, of which the Glossopterus is a part. Here are several of them. On the one in front of us, you can already see that the leaves are different from those we have seen so far. If, like me, you were a big fan of Littlefoot the Dinosaur, its leaves must undoubtedly make you think of the famous tree stars that the long neck savor with greed in this animated series. But beyond the nostalgic note of our childhood that this tree is synonymous with, it can also be talkative and tell us its past. Come closer to this one, whose trunk has probably split a few years ago. As you can see, the wood of the trunk and the branches have rings. These rings indicate that it has lived in a climate with distinct seasons, much like what we know today in temperate regions. Another peculiarity, it seems that this species had deciduous leaves. The cycle of the seasons thus seems to play an important role in this area of the world. Now that you know more about the forest than the different trees that make it up, it's time for you to go and meet its inhabitants. I hope you have good shoes. In this part of the world, during the Carboniferous period, you will be able to see for yourself how closely the flora and fauna are linked. You've already seen how much the plant cover has changed so far, haven't you? Well, you'll be just as surprised by the diversification of the fauna. Until a few million years ago, there was hardly a living soul on Earth. The different levels of the forest have a characteristic hummus and litter as well as an increasing variety of herbaceous plants, shrubs, and trees. All this favors the cycle of life, develops a food chain, and an increasingly rich ecosystem. You can see winged insects, millipedes, spiders, scorpions, amphibians, and even reptiles Let's start by surprising you. Yes, I can assure you that this first specimen should make you react. See that flying animal flying over the bank near the river? It's not a bird. No, far from it. They will appear much later. So who is it? It's Meganura a giant dragonfly. Yes, you heard me right, a dragonfly. With its 70 centimeter or 28 inch wingspan, you'll admit that it's quite surprising. Other specimens of the genus are much more reasonable in size, like the Stenodictia that you can see right there with its nine centimeter length. Let's leave the aquatic environment to fix our attention on the ground. In the Carboniferous, everything sometimes seems to be out of proportion. If you were surprised by our pretty dragonfly earlier, I believe that this millipede should also cause you to be amazed. Yes, this Ancantherpestis is indeed a millipede, despite its 50 centimeter or 20 inches long. But this is nothing compared to the one I would like to show you in a few moments. For that, we have to go a little further into the coal forest. 
Are you a gambler? What do you say we place a bet? How big is the Arthopleura? To find out, look at the movements under this fern. They announce its arrival. 1.5 meters or 5 feet long. That's as surprising as it is scary, right? The Arthopleura armata, on the other hand, can reach 2.5 meters or over 8 feet. You won't be surprised either if I tell you that these large terrestrial invertebrates, probably the most gigantic of all times, had no or few predators. None could compete because of their size. If such animals were roaming our forests today, there would be far fewer people during the mushroom picking season in the undergrowth. So far, we have never crossed paths with an amphibian. You can't miss it. Let's get closer to the water again to try our luck. Here we can see what we could call protritons, that is, amphibians that breathe through gills and that probably represent the larva or tadpole of some primitive batrachians. But it is the adults that I would like to find now. Look, here is a beautiful adult, actinodon, it must measure a little less than one meter or less than three feet. The eyes and nostrils are small and not very marked. We can recognize it by its triangular head, which is a bit similar to the one of the actual crocodiles. It is not only in that that it resembles him, since it is equipped with pointed teeth, what makes him a carnivore. We are going to leave the Carboniferous on the image of this actinodon and progress a little more on the time scale. The magic has worked and you have, I hope, enjoyed your passage through the Carboniferous. But our journey continues. It is already time to leave. More discoveries await you. We have arrived at the Permian. This period is literally a period of beginnings and ends. You'll see that while it allows for the emergence of new species, many others will disappear. The Permian is also characterized by a clearer zonation of our planet. There is sometimes significant precipitation around mountain ranges, while in other parts of the landmass, the rainfall rate is low. There are warm, dry regions with savanna-like vegetation and deserts. But at the South Pole, the temperature can drop to minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. We recognize the vegetation of the Carboniferous with the presence of Lipidodendron and Sigillaria. But little by little, a clearer demarcation between the North and South takes shape. One finds essentially conifers in the north, like Walchia, and Glossopteridales in the south. Over time, the Permian also witnessed the evolution of plants and land cover. Prehistoric plants such as lycopods gradually give way to Glossopterids. Seed plants, ferns, conifers, and cycads colonized the continent and formed a new food chain that was essential for the many new reptiles to come. Another Permian phenomenon is the synapsids. Although they appeared at the end of the Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, it was during the Permian that they dominated the Earth. We still know very little about their ancestors and the primitive stages of synapsids. They seem to have appeared from nowhere, what we do know is that there were three major groups in the Carboniferous. The Ophiacodontidae and the Sphenicodontidae, which both form the carnivorous branches of the synapsids, and the Edifosauridae, which is a vegetarian group. Until now, the carnivorous diet was dominant. They are the first vertebrates to follow another diet. These three groups are attached to the Pelicosaurus, a group that seems to define their common ancestor. In the Permian, 
a fourth group appears. It is that of the Cassidae. They too are vegetarians. Are you ready to meet these animals? Then follow me. The synapsid in front of you is a Gorgonopsian, Lycanops. A long skull, canines, and long incisors, you can't miss him. From his teeth, he is not a vegetarian. These teeth were fearsome and sharp weapons to defeat his victims. The bite was really powerful. He may not be fast, but he is pretty smart and strategic. He uses the bites as his strike force. After wounding his victim, he hides behind. He's in ambush, ready to return to the charge if needed, then return in extremis to hide. The purpose of this maneuver? To have his victim exhausted and succumb to his wounds without taking too much risk for his own life. When the heart stops beating, he just has to enjoy his meal. In the same group, there is also the Gorgonopsian, Rubigine. He was certainly the most robust of the family given his physique, but he also held the prize for the most powerful and impressive bite. In the interest of fairness, to redress the balance, let's meet an ambassador of the herbivore family. You'll easily recognize him. In addition to sporting a reptilian look, He's one of the only ones in the area to graze on ferns and other low plants within his reach. Vegetarian diet was not very common at that time. Here it is. Here is our long-awaited Dinocephalus keratocephalus. Its name means horned head. It measures between two and three meters long or up to 10 feet, and its skull is rather imposing. Depending on the specimen and the species, it weighs between 700 and 1,000 kilograms, or between 1,500 and 2,200 pounds. The diconodont is another emblematic animal of the Permian. Vertebrate and herbivorous, it has a very particular physique. Its attractions evoke both a rodent and a turtle, but it has tusks and beaks. One of the species of the Diconodont family is the Lysowicia. It is far from being a featherweight, since it is about 4.5 meters or 15 feet long, and nearly 2.5 meters or 8 feet in height. It is the largest Diconodont. Right in front of you, that's nine tons moving around. Oh look, about 10 meters away from it is a Diplocolis. This amphibian lives near rivers and mountain streams. Its name means double cap. It owes it to its boomerang-shaped skull. For the rest, it looks a bit like a salamander, despite its meter long. Its tail helps it in its movements, a bit like a pendulum. Another primitive amphibian impresses by its size. It is the Eriops. The body measures 2 meters or 7 feet on average, but specimens reaching nearly 3 meters or 10 feet are not uncommon. In spite of this extremely long body, its head seems disproportionate. It is big, wide, and flat. The mouth is huge, and like frogs, the teeth are curved. It has three pairs of fangs that wait with bated breath for its next victim. Considering the size of some dragonflies, the size of its mouth should be at least proportional. But it is far from being the only predator in the area. Here is the Dimetrodon. It is a kind of rather massive reptile, which has short and powerful legs, a long tail, and a fearsome jaw. It is equipped with two types of teeth. While the first ones grab and hold, the other ones shear and shred. It is better to avoid putting your fingers in it. Another particularity is its dorsal veil. It allows him to support the big variations of temperatures and climate. 
Thanks to this veil, it can regulate the temperature by storing or evacuating the accumulated heat. If there are many carnivores, herbivores are also present. One of them is the Periosaurus. It is one of the largest reptiles of the Permian. Its body is protected by a real armor. It is covered with scales. I hope we will have the chance to see one. The term Periosaurus means cheeked lizards. These parareptiles are herbivores and they eat an astronomical amount of food per day. Let's get closer to their favorite food. We might have a little better luck. Here they are, the Bradysaurus. Rather stocky, they have large feet to support their weight, which could reach 100 kilos for the biggest. They have a short tail, a small head, but a massive and robust body. Another member of the family, much more imposing than our Bradysaurus, is the Bunostegos. This time we are approaching 600 kilos, or 1,300 pounds. Before continuing our journey through time, you must meet two very important families. They are emblematic of the Permian and have marked the history of our planet and of life. The first one is the mammalian reptiles. During the Permian, as the climate dried out, the pelicosaurs declined in favor of another lineage of synapsids better able to resist it, the therapsids, whose morphological characteristics were more similar to mammals. One of their lineages will give birth to the family of mammals. They have differentiated teeth, canines and sizers, molars, premolars, hair, like the synognathus, limbs under their body and not on the sides or a single temporal fossa. If I mention the term saber teeth, you are probably thinking of the famous saber toothed tiger. But I can assure you that this one, despite its impressive canines, looks nothing like a tiger. It is rather a cross between a turtle and a pig. Here is the Glanosuchus, Macrops. It has a long snout and large canines, but it also has incisors in the shape of a blade, six on each side. Behind the canines, five small pointed teeth complete the heavy artillery of the animal. The nostrils are located at the end of the muzzle and directed towards the front. This must have been a precious help during the hunt. If I wanted to show you this Glanosuchus macrops, it is because it is of particular interest. It allows us to support our approach to evolution and to better understand how it has operated on the surface of the Earth. You can't see it, yet a major change has taken place in the skeletons of some animals. We are still in the early stages, but this is the first step of an important change the middle ear of mammals. Mammals now have three essential bones in the middle ear, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. It would seem that these were formed from the joint bone and square bone of these early therapsids. The second iconic Permian family is the archosaur family. Why archosaurs? because they will give rise to dinosaurs, crocodiles, pterosaurs, and phytosaurs. They all have a common ancestor in the archosaurs. So who are they? The classification of archosaurs is based on shared morphological characteristics, such as an anti-orbital window, i.e. a lateral opening in the skull located in the front of the orbits, but also serrated teeth and an upright position. Here are two of them, the Proterosaurus spinneri first. Very slender, it looks like a lizard and has some similarities with the monitor. It has long legs, a long neck, 
and can measure up to two meters or seven feet long. Despite a nice set of teeth, it is not a carnivore. It feeds rather on conifer cones. Another member of the genus is hidden a little further in this mass of vegetation. The Archosaurus rosicus is, as for him, well and truly carnivorous. Its appearance is a bit unusual. Its body is similar to that of a crocodile, while the head is finally rather undefinable. It seems to have a kind of trunk, a bit like that of an elephant or an anteater, but at the same time, this pseudo trunk forms a mouth that can open and close. Moreover, when it opens its mouth, you can see that the upper jaw is made up of two parts. One rests on the lower jaw, the other protrudes from the lower lip. Dinosaurs have undoubtedly marked history. It fascinates the crowds from a very young age. Many of us are attracted to these animals. Their extinction is an event that everyone has already heard about. However, this mass extinction is far from being the most important one our planet has ever known. The most serious one is happening now, at the end of the Permian. It will mark the beginning of the Triassic period and will upset the order of things forever. 70% of terrestrial genera and almost 95% of marine genera will disappear. The origin of the phenomenon is still unclear, but the massive volcanic eruptions that you can see in the distance are undoubtedly part of it. Since then, the air has become considerably depleted of oxygen. Large parts of southern Pangaea were covered by glaciers, but conditions have warmed considerably since the volcanic eruptions that marked the early Triassic. Nothing will ever be the same again. The change is too sudden and brings with it the disappearance of many species. The trilobites, although abundant until now, will be eradicated from the surface of the Earth. The species has become extinct, like many other marine animals. Others, if they have not disappeared, have been considerably affected. This is the case of the reef builders, for example. Many species of corals will not survive. Echinoderms and ammonoids will manage to survive the crisis thanks to a small handful of species. In unicellular organisms and foraminifera, the damage is considerable. On land, the situation is just as distressing. Nearly 60% of tetrapods have disappeared from the surface of the globe as have the large herbivores, which will not be able to resist the extreme and hostile climatic conditions. They are totally dependent on plants to survive. No more vegetation, no more food. It's certain death. Despite everything, after this biological crisis, nature gradually takes its rights. Temperatures rise and the landscape changes we can see appearing of forests much more vast. These are located near the equator and benefit from the monsoons. These are the first forests that can be considered tropical. Other ecosystems around the world have become much drier with the appearance of desert areas, which has stimulated the evolution of new types of reptiles better adapted to cope with the arid climate. Fauna and flora are constantly evolving. We are entering a new era. We leave the Paleozoic, which begins in the Cambrian and ends in the Permian, to enter the Mesozoic. We have an appointment with the Triassic. What are we waiting for to get back on the road? Triassic, here we come. We are entering the Triassic, a period that began about 252 million years ago. 
The large size of Pangaea favors an accentuated continental climate. It is marked by very hot summers and particularly cold winters. If the monsoon settles in the intertropical zone, as we have seen previously, arid and dry areas extend elsewhere on the continent. Many plant and animal species do not survive the Permo-Triassic crisis. Lycopodiales, Psychodales, Ginkophytes, and Glossopterides manage to resist for a while, but over the millennia, they too gradually disappeared from the surface of the Earth, as did many amphibians and mammalian reptiles. As for the conifers, they continue their way and now constitute the essential of the vegetation cover of our Earth. As for the animals, the vegetation having changed, new species have appeared. If the amphibians disappear little by little, the few survivors will give birth to modern amphibians, such as lysamphibians. The mammalian reptiles are less and less present. All these species progressively gave way to diaspid reptiles and in particular to archosaurs, which in turn gave birth to new branches that marked the history of life, crocodiles, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs. Even if their arrival is very discreet for the moment, some species of turtles and mammals will also make their appearance. The first mammals are of marsupial type. They are called metatherians. We have many species to discover. Let's take a closer look. Here we go. How about starting our expedition by meeting the lysamphibians? They have an aquatic life phase when they are still larvae then a terrestrial life phase. They can be found near this stream. They only like fresh water. In the larval state, they breathe thanks to their gills. Then at the adult age, the lungs take over, even if they can also breathe by the skin. As you can see, they have four limbs and belong to the vertebrates. This group includes several branches, such as gymnophions, batrachians, salamanders, and neurons, frogs, toads, and kidneys. Here is one of the veterans of the group, the Lysamphibians. To date, it is the oldest known to scientists. It is a triadobatrachus, Massinati. It looks a lot like a frog and measures about 10 centimeters or 4 inches. Other Dean in its category, the Proterosuchus. It is part of the Archosauriformes. Look, here is a Proterosuchus fergusi. Do you see it? It moves in the direction of the river to quench its thirst. This quadruped can reach more than three meters. It has a big head and a slightly hooked snout. As you can see, its position is tentacular. The limbs are not located under its belly, but rather on the side, hence this particular walk. This does not prevent it from lying in ambush to flush out its prey. It is an accomplished predator. It is also equipped with a mesopic vision, that is to say that it can see at the same time in the bright light of the day, but also in the half-light. Let's leave him to his hunting. Another predator is waiting for us a little further. It is part of the emerging group of crocodilomorphs. When we talk about crocodiles today, we have the image of a rather stocky animal, not very active, except when hunting, and rather adapted to an aquatic and marine life. But at the beginning of the Triassic period, the species forming the group of crocodilomorphs were much more varied than today, and their silhouette was quite different. They are smaller, but also lighter and more active. 
Look, this giant and spindly lizard is one of them. It is a Terrastrosuchus gracilis. It's true that its appearance suggests a lizard rather than a crocodile, but it is indeed a member of this group. It measures about one meter or three feet for about 15 kilos or about 30 pounds. It has long, thin, and muscular legs. To maintain its balance, it uses its tail. In terms of size, it represents the double of its body. Since the beginning of our trip, we have had the opportunity to observe many plant and animal species. Through these observations, we have tried to analyze and understand the evolutionary pathway to determine the changes that have taken place over time. From observations to questions, we managed to find some answers. Now that you are almost an expert, are you ready to start this thought process alone? So looking a little closer at this Terrastrosuchus gracilis, what could you add about the shape and position of its legs? The first element is the posture. The legs are positioned directly under the body, which has an impact on the gait, but also on the possibilities of movement. Then, the hind legs are slightly longer than the front legs. If we add to that an important musculature, we obtain a king of the race. Well, as it is clear that we will not be able to compete in terms of speed with this crocodilomorph, I think it is now time for us to continue our journey. How about discovering another branch born from the archosaurs, the pterosaurs, Pterosaurs are flying reptiles. Can you imagine how far we've come? It took a long time for evolution to allow animals to colonize the Earth, but very few of them until now had managed to conquer the sky. The reasons for this small feat are still mysterious. We still don't know how the passage from a terrestrial and probably bipedal ancestor to flying and quadrupedal animals linked to very particular ecosystems took place. Some of them were real kings of the air. Others, because of their imposing size, managed to move in the sky with more difficulty, and this required considerable energy. I am thinking of Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsagupteryx, which are very large flying reptiles Ostriodactylus is one of the first pterosaurs. It is about 90 centimeters or 35 inches long and weighs 15 kilos or 30 pounds. When it spreads its wings, we approach 120 centimeters or 50 inches of span. What characterizes it is its crest on the front of the skull. It also has a long tail that serves as a rudder. It is, in a way, a cross between a giant bat and a wolf with a long tail. The Quetzalcoatlus, Northropi, appeared much later, since it flew over the ground in the Cretaceous period. The one you see here looks a bit like a stork with its long neck. You're probably wondering how long its wingspan is. I won't leave you wondering any longer it can reach 10 meters or 30 feet. As for its diet, it is difficult to determine what was its favorite menu. If at first we thought of fish, it turns out that this giant of the sky probably preferred the carcasses of small terrestrial animals. We can't cross into the Triassic without encountering a member of the Euparcarius family. Come on. We have to move and get into the outskirts of this thick vegetation if we want to meet one of them. Here it is. There, only a few meters away from us. It moves and seems to approach us. Let's stay a little behind. 
It is a quadruped, and it seems to fulfill all the characteristics required to give birth to future dinosaurs. This one is a Eupocoria capensis, to be quite precise. As you can see, it is indeed a quadruped and has semi-erect limbs. If you are observant, you will also notice that the hind limbs are slightly longer than the front ones. Some researchers suggest that it could have been bipedal from time to time when the need arose, but this is still just a guess. Oh, did you have time to see this Eupercaria jumping? Exclusively quadruped or bipedal at times, no doubt that it has a perfect command of its limbs' mobility in any case. Now that you have seen a Eupercarius, it is time to meet our first dinosaurs. How about we start with one of the oldest of them, the Nyasaurus. It is a member of the Dinosauriform family. I present you Nyasaurus Peringtoni. It measures two to three meters long, that is to say up to 10 feet long, and if it stands on its two back legs, it is not to greet you. His front legs are shorter. Its tail allows it to maintain its balance. The dinosaurs will form two big families at first, the Saurischians that we will see now, and the Ornithischians that we will meet a little later. In the family of the Saurischians, there is the Musser. The animal that you see just in front of you measures barely 20 centimeters or 8 inches, and it is a Mosaurus patagonicus. But don't let its small size fool you. This one is just a baby. As an adult, it can reach 3 meters or 10 feet, some even reach 6 meters or 20 feet long. The mother of this young Musser can't be far away. Let's be careful. Do you hear that thud? Do you feel those vibrations on the ground? There's another animal approaching, and it's not a featherweight. There it is. It's a Lillian Sternus. It's almost 6 meters or 20 feet long, and must be easily over 2 meters or 7 feet high. He has a small crest on his skull, and rather sharp teeth. He is hunting. Let's stay here. He is chasing this pterosaur, a flying reptile, around the river. He has no chance to get out of it alive. After this hunting episode, what do you say we get to safety in search of a herbivore? Let's go back. The animal I'm looking for is special. Its name means flat reptile. This behemoth can reach 8 meters or 26 feet in length and weigh up to 4 tons. However, this land giant feeds exclusively on plants. Its long neck allows it to reach the fresh and tender leaves of trees, located at 3 or 4 meters or 13 feet from the ground. Look, there it is. It's a platosaurus. It extends its neck or stands on its hind legs for a few minutes to reach the best leaves. Look, one of his fellow creatures a few meters away from him is swallowing some rocks. He is not crazy, don't worry. He swallows these stones to help him crush the food in his stomach. These stones are called gastroliths. We are going to leave this platosaurus to enjoy his well-deserved meal and continue our route. It leads us straight to the Jurassic. We have finally arrived at the Jurassic period, between 201 and 145 million years ago. We have crossed millions of years to finally grow through this extraordinary period. It is at this time that Pangaea began to break up. 
water began to invade the continents, which favored the development of marine fauna and flora. On land, new mountainous formations sculpted a new silhouette of the Earth. Let's take a closer look at the vegetation that surrounds us. We find seed ferns and conifers, but as you can see, these species have become much more diverse. The vegetation cover is denser, thicker, more abundant and richer. There are some trees in front of us that you could meet in our time, like the Sikas, the Araucaria, the Yew, the Sequoia, or the Ginkgo. But they are not the only ones to occupy the ground. A little further, you can see plants of the family of Benetitales or Catoniellus. While observing this forest, did you notice anything? Look a little more at the shrubs in front of you. I think we are passing through at the right season. We are lucky. You can see one of the very first flowering plants, the angiosperms. The one that is a shrub type is a Benetitales wylandiella. The one that has an elongated palm shape is a Benetitales williamsonia, and finally, the low and stubby palm is a Psychodeoa. The flowers contain the reproductive apparatus of the plant, usually containing both male and female parts, except in some cases. The pollen grains are, as is still the case today, transported by wind or insects. Did you notice at the top of these treetops that a flying reptile was on the hunt? The pterosaur family is still very present in the Jurassic. The one you see there is probably a Ramphorhynchus. Its name means snout with a beak. It has a mouthful of teeth in the shape of needles and inclined towards the front. The tip of its mouth is curved, pointed, and forms a kind of beak, hence its name. For the first time since we left, we are dealing with an exclusively Piscivorous predator. Look, a Ramphorhynchus, Munsteri, approaches the water. It is time to eat. He swims for a few minutes. He will attack any second. I see that he is not alone. There are many other flying reptiles lurking around. Look, they are much smaller. They are Pterodactylus and Tweakus. You probably know it as a pterodactyl. This carnivore preys mainly on fish, but it does occasionally set its sights on small land-based prey. Look at the pterodactyl perched on this rock. Can you see it flapping its wings on the spot? It seems to be opening its wings wide just for us. This is a great opportunity. It allows us to better appreciate the details of its morphology. Like all pterosaurs, our flying reptile has wings formed by a skin and muscle membrane. It extends from its fourth finger to its hind limbs. From here, you can see its little soft tissue crest above its head. This means that it must be an adult. Juveniles do not have one. Pterodactyls develop this soft tissue growth when they are older. Some scientists think that this asset, above all aesthetic, had to play a role during the courtship to find it's beautiful. When it opens its mouth, we see that it has an army of small teeth ready to fight with its next victim. Ninety fine and conical teeth. That makes some sharp blades. It's time for us to move away from the lake and go a little further inland into the forest. Do you remember we talked about two families of dinosaurs, Saurischians and Ornithischians? I think it's time for you to understand the difference between these two families. 
The dissimilarity between the two families is in the pelvis. Saurischians have a pelvis similar to reptiles with a pubic bone, pointing forward, while the pelvis of ornithischians has four branches and the pubic bone points backwards, like that of birds. We will meet several of their respective members. Let's go! Let's start with the Saurischian family. There are two specimens you may have heard of, the Diplodocus and the Brachiosaurus. Here is a herd of Diplodocus. They live in groups of 20 to 30 individuals to protect themselves from predators. Its long neck measures more than 6 meters or 20 feet on its own. From the top of its head to the tip of its tail, it's 35 meters or 115 feet. Yes, it's quite an animal. Yet it feeds exclusively on leaves and small plants, like the ferns you can see here and there. So the vegetarian diet is good. It is not part of the same family, but it has some common characteristics with a Diplodocus. It is the Brachiosaurus. We often confuse them. The one on our left is a Brachiosaurus, Altothorax. He is a greedy one. It feeds as much on low plants like cycas as on coniferous leaves and tree ferns. Generally, brachiosaurs also move in herd. The youngest are thus protected from predators by remaining in the center of the group. Their tail serving as a balance is necessary for their balance. But it could also, in case of danger, turn into a deadly whip. It measures about 25 meters or 115 feet long, 12 meters or 40 feet high, and surely weighs between 30 and 50 tons. Its neck has 12 vertebrae. Yes, despite the length of the neck, the vertebrae are not very numerous. On the other hand, they measure about 70 centimeters or 27 inches each. Beware, here is an Allosaurus. As you can imagine, there is nothing friendly about it. It is the most common predator in the area. The species has spread widely around the world, but it prefers semi-arid environments and floodplains with wet and dry seasons. It has a small neck, a narrow and elongated skull, and a large and robust body. There is no question of lingering too long, but look at his feet. He has three load-bearing toes and an inner dew claw. He can run with ease and reach 55 kilometers per hour, or 35 miles per hour. Here is another biped walking on strong, short, robust hind legs. This is a Megalosaurus. It is at the top of the food chain and feared by all. It has long curved teeth and knows how to use them perfectly. We should take advantage of a moment of inattention of the predator to slip away and go in search of the ornithischian dinosaurs. Let's start with a Scuttlosaurus. The particularity of this dinosaur lies in its armor. Its body is covered with osteoderms, that is to say, bone deposits forming scales, plates, or a bumpy structure based under the dermis. The armor of our specimen is rather light. It does not hinder its movements. The Stegosaurus is characterized by large bony plates. It has two rows of plates all along the back, from the head to the end of the tail. You have nothing to fear from him. He is a herbivore. It lives along Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, and Apatosaurus. If its bone armor is an asset to defend itself against predators in adulthood, in the infantile and juvenile stage, it is a perfect prey for Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. 
Here is a Kentrosaurus. It is part of the Stegosaurian herbivorous dinosaurs. It is smaller, and its armor is a little different, but we recognize the main characteristics of the Stegosaurus. Here is a rather surprising dinosaur. It is a Dryosaurus. It belongs to the class of Iguanodonts. It particularly appreciates the forest environments. It has a long neck, but also long, thin legs and a stiff tail. We can also recognize him with the presence of his five fingers on each hand. It shares its habitat with herbivores, such as Nanosaurus and Stegosaurus, but also with the first mammals, such as the Docodonts. If many of them are insectivores and live on the ground, Others, like the Castoracata, were surely semi-aquatic beings. To observe them, we must approach the waterways. It fed perhaps on insects like this dragonfly, Tarsophlebia, but also on fish. Another mammal resembling a rodent appreciated the forest. It is the multi Berculata. It can nest in a burrow as well as live in the trees. A little further on, there is a Teniolebis, one of the representatives of this family and probably the biggest of all. It's time for you to discover other animal families, especially the mammals. In the category of the first mammals, I present you the Eutraconodonta. It is a very small, insectivorous mammal. Some of them are venomous mammals. They either use their venom to neutralize prey, or they use it to defend themselves against predators. Others have a fur. Hair is still rare, but species such as Velaticotherium that small gliding mammal you see right there have it. Before we leave the Jurassic, I'd like to introduce you to one last group, the almost bird dinosaurs. They are the key to the transition from dinosaurs to birds. Look at this, Anchiornis. It has four wings and probably a lot of feathers. It's only 12 centimeters or five inches tall, but it already has some bird-like features. Examine its thighs. They look like a chicken's. He also has what you might call pads under his feet, and his tail is slender. I'd like you to scan the sky for another flycatcher. This is the Archaeopteryx. It is an important animal, because it will probably become the ancestor of our birds in the future. The bird that is a little bit bigger than the Anchiornis, about 50 centimeters or 20 inches long. You can't miss it. Here it is, the missing link between dinosaurs and birds, Archaeopteryx. It has long feathers, especially on the tips of its wings and legs, and down on the rest of its body. The remiges, these large feathers at the level of the wings which allow the birds to fly, were asymmetrical, like those of the current birds. It can thus fly, or at least glide. Even if the ballet is very nice to see, we will leave these gods of the sky to fly towards the Cretaceous, our final destination. Here we are, at the beginning of the Cretaceous, 145 million years ago. The vegetation cover is more or less the same. We still find a lot of conifers, even if they progressively give way to angiosperms, the flowering plants that we could see in the Jurassic. The development of these flowering plants favors the expansion of mechopterans and beetles the first pollinating insects. The small beetles frequent the cycas a lot. Mechoptera, like shady places, 
and move on the plants. They feed on insect carrion. Hymenoptera, like bees, appear alongside butterflies. They play an essential role in pollination and therefore on the development of vegetation. Other emblematic species of the Cretaceous have made their appearance. As you can imagine, they are part of the great family of dinosaurs. Here again, we will talk about the two main branches of dinosaurs that we have already studied in the Jurassic. Among the Ornithischians, there is the Myasaurus. It is not as well known as the Triceratops or the Tyrannosaurus. However, it marked the Cretaceous period. It is a herbivorous dinosaur. We can recognize it by its duckbill-shaped snout. The Myasaurus lives in herds. Let's follow these tracks. They should lead us to them. Here they are, the Myasaurs. They are very popular for their exemplary parenthood. Look, here is the space dedicated to nesting. You can see about 10 nests, quite close to each other. The Myasaurus designed elaborate nests and cared for its offspring, but not only. It was one of the very first animals to do this. What you see here is colonial nesting. The ones protect the others and thus increase the chances of survival of the group. When the young come out of their shells, the adults take turns to educate and protect the young. There's another fact I want to tell you about these dinosaurs. Unlike most of them, the Myasaurus does not lie on the eggs during nesting. They carefully prepare their nests with different plant materials to provide the warmth and protection necessary for the development of their young. The young female you see here is busy designing her nest. A female could lay up to 30 eggs simultaneously. It is therefore necessary to have a large enough space to accommodate all this little world. The Myasaurus live in herds. They are not the first herbivores that we have seen working like this. However, few were as large as the group we see here. Some groups range from a hundred to thousands of individuals. The food requirement must have been very important for a group of this size. To meet this need, our herd must be nomadic and make seasonal migrations. In the Ornithischian family, there is a dinosaur that you know well. It is the Triceratops. Even though you know it's a herbivore, it's still impressive. Let's get a little closer and learn more. From the top of its 3 meters or 10 feet, and its 9 meters or 30 feet of length, it is impressive. It is as heavy as a truck. His skull alone is impressive. It has the record of the widest skull of all the dinosaurs, 2.5 meters or 8 feet wide. We can easily recognize it thanks to its three horns and its bony collar. The first two horns, located on the forehead, are the longest and measure about 1 meter or 3 feet. For many years, scientists have been debating about Triceratops and Torosaurus. You can actually see one of them at the back of the group. The Torosaurus has a ruff with two large circles on each side. When you look at the skeletons of these dinosaurs, you can see that they are indeed holes in the ruff. According to the latest studies, the Triceratops would finally be the juvenile form of Torosaurus, but the debate is still open. Some older juveniles show signs of the development of this famous collar with holes. After having shared a moment with these herbivores, we must now take our courage in both hands and approach a little closer to the carnivores. Some of them are approaching. Hunger is driving them. We are going to change their diet. 
but also their branch, since the majority of them are Sarishians. Tyrannosaurus rex is often mentioned when studying dinosaurs. Its massive head, powerful jaw, and 60 fearsome teeth have made it one of the best-known predators of the Cretaceous period. But he wasn't the biggest. Look at this Spinosaurus. It wears a veil of skin supported by bony spines all along its spine and exceeds in length the Tyrannosaurus by almost 3 meters or 10 feet. It is 6 meters or 20 feet high and can reach more than 15 meters or 50 feet long and weigh up to 12 tons. Not all carnivores are so impressive and do not compete in terms of height or weight. The Huaxia gnathus, for example, is much smaller. It is less than one meter or three feet tall and almost two meters or seven feet long. The front limbs are more developed than the back ones. It relies on this asset during its hunting parties to capture its prey, small reptiles but also mammals, like this Jangiotherium. The Sinosauropteryx, the dinosaur with a head with a black mask and a striped tail, is just over a meter long and shares the same diet as Huaxionathus. Its dress is used as camouflage. It stands in ambush to better surprise its prey and capture them. Nature and evolution allow each animal to adapt to its environment in order to increase its chances of survival. There is another emblematic animal of the Cretaceous that has left its mark. It would be the most intelligent of the dinosaurs. This is probably true because compared to other dinosaurs, the size of its brain was much larger in proportion to the rest of its body. But that's far from the only thing that makes it unique. It has advanced binocular vision. Unlike other dinosaurs, it can target its prey better, even when they are alive and trying to escape. Here you can see a Trudone nest, and in them it is the male who broods. If the dinosaurs lay eggs, the placental mammals are developing more and more. Eomea scansoria is one of these small viviparous mammals. The young are still very precocious at their birth and not very developed. We are still at the beginning of the placental mammals. Adult, the Omea, measures 10 centimeters or four inches long at most. You can see that its feet are made of small bones and cartilage to facilitate mobility. If you get a little closer, you can see that it also has a nice coat. A little further, it is a Cenodelphus, Salaya. It is active only at night. This gives us the opportunity to observe it a little closer during its resting phase. It has a long tail and an elongated snout. Its feet and hands are very similar to those of opossums. This allows him to climb and cling to trees. This ability has allowed him to escape many predators on the ground. It is on this small sleeping Sinodelphus that we have to leave us. Our trip is coming to an end. He is probably not aware of it, but a terrible biological crisis is approaching. It occurs 66 million years before us. Two hypotheses are advanced. The first evokes the fall of a giant meteorite in the current Yucatan it will cause colossal damage. The traces of this catastrophe are still visible today thanks to the existence of the Chicxulub crater in the north of the peninsula of Mexico. It measures nearly 180 kilometers or 110 feet in diameter. Imagine the power of the impact 
and the deflagrations that the animals could feel at that moment. The stupor, the incomprehension, then the terror. The collision caused violent fires and emissions of particles into the atmosphere. Nothing let the sun's rays through anymore. Light is essential for the photosynthesis of plants. The food chain was quickly broken. A second hypothesis also speaks of major volcanic eruptions in the traps of the Deccan in India. Here again, gas particles will be released into the atmosphere. The climate is changing too abruptly for most terrestrial species to adapt. Other scientists consider the two events as a whole. The consequences are dramatic, violent, and brutal. However, some animals will manage to get out of it. If omnivores and scavengers are undoubtedly the best equipped to survive, we find crocodiles, snakes, some lizards, turtles, but also some mammals. One chapter ends, but another begins. The story of life is far from over and many surprises and discoveries await us elsewhere.